I think I may have been. All right, everybody hear me now? Yay? Yes? Okay, good. Sorry. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, Parlor Car Chats. Um, this is a program of the San Luis Obispo Railroad Museum, which is what this first slide is, is trying to share to you. This is an image of the website's homepage. Um, all the information for upcoming and re previously recorded chats are on there. You go to that uh, link that labeled details under the parlor car picture there on the left. Uh, you can also donate to the museum uh, this way uh, through that sort of white area there in the middle. Um, that uh, uh, lets you, um, let me get it right here. Sorry about that. Um, since the museum's income is kind of down to nothing with no activity really uh, at the museum, uh, that would be very helpful. Okay, one other uh, preliminary thing to talk about is the uh, chat system. If, if you want to connect with me or, or uh, Glenn, who is going to be our speaker today, uh, use the chat system. It's, it's a, you'll find it as a little uh, cartoon bubble for text or the word chat or both um, somewhere on your control screen. Uh, that way I'll see it. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be monitoring that actually a little better than I normally do because I don't have to be, be uh, talking. Um, and then I can relay questions to Glenn or um, deal with any issues that may come up. Okay, so I keep mentioning Glenn. Glenn Madison is our uh, presenter for today, and he's going to uh, be talking about the, his topic, Lost in the Details, um, Gauges, Couplers, and Brakes. Uh, I think that's, in fact, the order. So, Glenn, are you, are you on there? Uh, hopefully I am. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, I was going to introduce this chat with a clever metaphor about not seeing the forest for the trees, but then I decided that since uh, railroads, maybe more than any, any other enterprise, depend on details for safe and efficient operation, I would just let that metaphor go. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, the big picture. I think what engages most of us emotionally about railroads is their uh, historic and, and geographic scope. Uh, the fact that they deal with movement through uh, time and space on a, on a grand scale. Uh, I wish I could take credit for this photo. I cannot. It's uh, BNSF Railway in northern Arizona, I think approaching the Crozier Canyon area. But in order for this kind of thing to happen, uh, literally thousands of details have to be attended to and, and working correctly. So let's start with the track gauge. Next slide, please. Okay, as uh, Jamie said, we're gonna work through track gauge, couplers, and brakes. Next slide. Okay, the most basic railroad elements, um, two steel rails, a set distance apart, which is the track gauge, uh, typically an axle and flanged wheels. Some vehicles don't use axles, but we won't get into that today. Um, you notice the track gauge uh, is measured uh, between the, the inner faces of the rail heads. Uh, and you also notice that I spelled gauge without a U in this slide because this is one I use for my, my Cal Poly students. And I decided that for them, because of the convention used by the American Railway Engineering and Maintenance of Way Association, I would spell gauge as the engineers do without a U. In my other life, uh, you know, with the museum and, and just talking with friends and acquaintances and writing things, I always put the U in because that seems to be what more people are comfortable with. Next slide. Okay, there's a, an urban uh, legend out there that the what we in North America consider the standard gauge is based on Roman chariots. Uh, I actually found an article that went into detail on why that's not true, um, and I could probably refer it for you to that article if you're interested in those details. But uh, what all uh, early railroads had in common was that they were horse-drawn conveyances. So the gauge is really related to the fact that they were. Uh, drawn by animals of a certain size, 
and that the people who were building the early railway uh, wagons for freight and what they called carriages for people uh, were also sized to horses proportions and you'll notice in that top illustration the bodies of the vehicles are inside the, the wheels as opposed to overhanging them. The bottom right image is the U.S. Gypsum narrow gauge uh, single purpose industrial railway down in Imperial County near the Mexican border where they use a three foot gauge and if you're used to looking at uh, conventional railroad equipment it, that seems to overhang way too much uh, because the typical width of a rail vehicle uh, is 10 feet and with rails about five feet apart uh, the vehicle width is about double the, the track, uh, the rail spacing. Uh, but when uh, narrow gauge uh, systems are built, typically the vehicles are narrower. Uh, this case that we're looking at uh, uses a, a locomotive built by a, you know, a mass manufacturer of locomotives, and so they just put uh, narrower wheel assemblies on on their standard uh, size locomotive. Next slide, please. This looks complicated uh, because it is. As systems were built in various places throughout the, uh, the world and in different eras, they used many different track gauges. Uh, standard gauge in North America, China, most of Western Europe uh, is, is uh, four feet, eight and a half inches. And that's the, the, the kind of medium blue there uh, noted in the, in the diagram. Uh, no, no real historical reason for why it's exactly that amount. Uh, it's not a, you know, an exact uh, metric measure either, either, which I can't remember. France was the origin of the metric system, and I can't remember. It seems like that was a, a maybe a 1700s or 1800s invention, but uh, uh, this diagram gives the dimensions both in so-called English feet and inches measurements and the metric uh, millimeters. Uh, the other common gauge, uh, relatively common used in the world, uh, is meter gauge, which is a little bigger than three feet. Uh, three feet is the typical uh, North American narrow gauge. Uh, though we had railroads, uh, the, the main so-called two-footers, uh, as little as uh, nominally two feet. Um, 30 inches has been used. Uh, three and a half feet, the so-called Cape gauge, which is common in New Zealand, some of Australia, traditional Japan, South Africa. It was also used for the Los Angeles streetcars, the San Francisco cable cars, and the Better Avia Feedlot Railroad, which is another detail for uh, another day. And then we have real weird outliers like the Toronto subway and streetcar lines, which are four feet, ten and seven eighths inches. Uh, again, I have no idea why. Uh, the, many of these uh, states in the Confederacy, the southern United States, uh, used five-foot gauge. Uh, the reason that the uh, gauge in uh, Russia was slightly larger than uh, the rest of Western Europe, and, and Russia always saw itself as really uh, more a, a European country than the one that spans clear to uh, you know, across uh, Asia, Siberia to the Pacific, they were concerned that they might, might be inv invaded by a country in Western Europe. And so they made their track gauge just enough wider that if the German armies tried to roll their uh, equipment and supplies in by rail, it, it wouldn't work. Uh, of course, that proved to be not particularly helpful in both uh, World War One and World War II. Uh, but it is a, certainly an obstacle to to through a service today. Uh, likewise, uh, the so-called Iberian gauge, uh, Iberian Peninsula, including Spain and Portugal, is a bit wider uh, than standard gauge and also a bit wider than the Russian gauge. Uh, apparently their reason was the same. Spain was concerned that they would be invaded by France, uh, which never happened. Uh, but once they had made the decision and invested a lot in their infrastructure in the, the 1800s, it's expensive and difficult to change. Uh, let's see, other notable features, the uh, Indian subcontinent uh, gauge being five feet six inches. You'd think being a former British uh, colony that they would have done something very British, 
Why they chose five feet six inches, I don't know. Uh, BART, also Bay Area Rapid Transit, chose that gauge in the, the early 1960s, mid-1960s. The story at the time that was put out to the public was that that gauge was having a little bit wider uh, spacing between the rails was more stable, especially on the curves, and you could have vehicles that were a little bit wider, which is true, but wasn't the real reason. Uh, the real reason was that when the BART system was uh, proposed for the nine-county Bay Area, uh, many communities were concerned that conventional railroads would be running their freight trains on BART's tracks, uh, and the railroads uh, in the area, um, at the time Southern Pacific uh, and Western Pacific, uh, were concerned that BART might somehow try to condemn access to their facilities and use their tracks. Uh, and so they made the gauge uh, just enough different that uh, the, the people in the corporate you know, and legal world would be assured that that would not happen. Uh, so next slide. Um, why is gauge measured from the inside uh, face of the rail heads down five eighths of an inch from the top? Not a half, not three quarters, five eighths. Well, I'm not sure about the five eighths, but it's not measured uh, from center to center like you would expect on most structural features like rafters and floor joists and wall studs, that sort of thing. Because rail comes in different weights. And the weight of the rail uh, can affect the width of the head. Uh, and if it wears unevenly, uh, that can, you know, what really counts is where the flanges, the wheel flanges, are going to contact the, the inside surfaces of the rail heads. Uh, in fact, even the contact surface between the, the wheels and the rail head is not at the center of the, of the rail head. So uh, that's why the, uh, that dimension is not used. Next slide. Of course, there have to be standards. Uh, as one, one of my instructors many years ago said, rules are for when brains run out. Well, there have to be rules on track gauge, and the Federal Railroad Administration sets them for the United States. Uh, this, <clears throat> excuse me, is part of a table that I put together to summarize a whole lot of FRA standards. Uh, and so if you're in the business of designing railroad tracks and maintaining them, don't go by what I say here. This is just to give a general idea. Uh, if you're in one of those occupations, you need to go to the FRA standards in Title 49 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, but you can tell that it uh, relates, it basically relates standards to the speed that's allowed. And when I was a young man, there were five uh, classes of track uh, since then, four more have been added in anticipation of higher and high-speed passenger service. Uh, the amount of inspection, frequency of inspection, depends on the track class. Uh, the gauge tolerance, how, how much uh, narrower or wider it can be than the standard, uh, and how much the gauge can vary with a certain distance along the track are shown here. Uh, when you have problems with gauge, it's almost always the, the rails becoming uh, farther apart, uh, gauge spreading, uh, rather than getting narrower. And I'm sure you can imagine why that's true with the, the wheel flanges, especially on curves, pushing on the outer rail uh, or on the inner rail. Um, and just the, the hunting and, and uh, back and forth oscillation of the vehicles and their wheels as they, they move down the tracks. Uh, tend to push the, the track gauge apart. Uh, next slide. So how do we deal with uh, national borders or even within countries where uh, track gauge may change? Well, if it's a passenger, um, passengers we're dealing with, they can get off of one train and get on to another. If it's freight, we can take all the things out of the box cars and off the flat cars, and I'm not aware of anybody draining tank cars and dealing with liquids, but we can then load them onto to properly gauged freight cars standing nearby. It's much easier if the freight is containerized. As most international freight is these days, we can lift up whole containers with either wheeled vehicles or gantry cranes and set them on the properly uh, gauged rolling stock. 
Uh, we can jack up the cars, roll the one set of trucks out the wheel assemblies and roll the others in, which is a complicated and time consuming process. But this was actually done on the border between China and Russia for their fruit through service. I, I don't know if it's still done. Uh, I kind of doubt it, but it may be. Maybe if a world traveler is, is attending today, they can enlighten us. The, the latest approach is uh, some combination of the, the last two bullets there. Uh, have wheels that can either move into one of two uh, locked positions on the axles or having axles that telescope, you know, a, a, basically a pipe inside of a pipe uh, that can be set in one of two positions. Uh, the Spanish are building their high-speed system to the standard gauge to connect with the rest of Western Europe. Uh, Batalgo, a Spanish company uh, which pioneered in, in exotic designs for uh, rail car suspension and, and wheel assemblies, uh, has come up with a, a gauge-changing device that's actually built into the track. So let's go to the next slide. And here we see it. Uh, it looks almost like the retarders that they use in, in hump yards, uh, gravity yards, where freight cars are sorted by rolling down an incline track. And, and uh, mechanical devices can apply pressure to the inside of the wheel uh, flanges and slow them down so that when they go into a roll through multiple switches into the right track to be sorted into a, an outgoing train that the car will travel at the correct speed. Uh, but here, uh, a worker would uh, unlock the mechanism on the car. It would roll slowly through the, the device, which would then force the wheels either in or out, depending on which way the transition is going, to the correct gauge. And then the worker would uh, relock and, and make sure that uh, everything is inspected and, and ready to go on the, the next leg of the journey. Next slide. Uh, many countries have uh, dual gauge uh, systems. Uh, Brazil is one that um, has both some older areas like you see in the upper left and some fairly new um, uh, freight uh, hauling systems on the lower right that uh, uh, operate uh, both gauges, you know, one gauge in one area, one gauge in another area, but where they have common service, they, they lay a third rail. Uh, in the track to accommodate both. And if the gauge differences aren't too big, it's possible to have a, a locomotive or a, a car on one system, have its coupler uh, connect with cars on the other system and move them as well. But I'm sure you can see that as, as the gauge disparity gets wider, it becomes less and less uh, practical to do that. Uh, next slide. Uh, Switzerland has, uh, it's, Switzerland is like, you know, a, a little country with an unlimited budget to spend on a model railroad system that they could build in the whole country. And so they have rack railways and both standard and narrow gauge, and they have uh, conventional adhesion railways, both standard and narrow gauge. And in some places they have, uh, you know, parallel systems and even a little bit of overlap, like this area where uh, uh, there's dual gauge to serve a, an industry. Uh, Switzerland's narrow gauge is meter gauge, about 39 inches. Their standard gauge is the same as ours. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is one I used to remind my Cal Poly students that they have things to be thankful for. They're not dealing with track maintenance in Gladstone, South Australia between 1969 and 1993 where there were four gauges. And I had to squint at this image and do some measuring with a, a little piece of cardboard and make sure I, I think I have these labeled right, um, where we have, or did I say four gauges? I meant to say three. Three gauges in use at once. Uh, three feet, six inches, the cape gauge four feet, eight and a half inches, standard gauge in North America, and five feet, three inches. And I'm not sure how those switch mechanisms work, but uh, in, in uh, there's something called puzzle switches or dual slip switches. They're also very confusing. 
I can't imagine having one of those in, in multiple gauge territory. I think you just give up and come up with a different solution. So let's see, I think, is this the last slide in this series? I think it is. Let's go to the next one. No, okay, so before we get into couplers, um, Jamie, do, does anybody have a question or a comment on, on track gauge? I don't I don't see any question coming in. Okay, then we'll move right along. Okay. We'll move right along to couplers. So once we have the uh, Jamie, I think it helps if you turn off your um, I'm hearing myself. There, there we go. That's better. Um, so we have the, the spacing of the rails. We have the type of vehicles and motive power we want. Now we need to take advantage of the, the big advantage of, of rail uh, transportation is that one source of motive power and one operator can move many vehicles uh, from one or two to 200, I think, is near the record for a uh, number of cars in a freight train. We need a way to connect them when we want them to be connected and to disconnect them when we don't want them to be connected. So the early couplers were these link and, and pin arrangements uh, where you had basically like a big bolt through the uh, item on the end of each car and a literally a, a link like a section of chain elongated that the pins would drop through that would provide the tension, the pulling uh, connection. But often there's pushing involved too, and so you need a, a buffer face, um, which is the um, indicated by the blue arrows there. They're, they're slightly curved to accommodate uh, motion on curves and oscillation back and forth. Um, a very hazardous arrangement because brakemen or conductors um, Yard men needed to get between the cars to uh, place and remove the pins. Uh, next slide. So the the ja so-called Janney coupler uh, is standard throughout North America uh, today. It's also standard in China. That's one of the interesting things about the Chinese system: their track gauge, their air brakes, their signals, and their their couplers on the conventional lines, at least, not the new high-speed lines. You could take North American locomotives and cars over there, and they'd work just fine. Um, so the, the uh, so-called automatic coupler uh, has a, a steel casting that has a knuckle that can move. Uh, when the knuckle is in the open position and you push two of these couplers together, they automatically uh, close and lock until you uh, use a cut lever, which is the narrow device there uh, below the, the body of the coupler. Uh, you use that to pull. Uh, it, it looks like it would pull the pin down. I think there's actually a, a lever that, that lifts the pin um, because it's always referred to as pulling or lifting the pin uh, to get them to uncouple. Uh, the, the draft gear uh, in some uh, cars allow some movement lengthwise of the, the shaft of the coupler uh, to reduce the impact if cars uh, roll together at a, a speed a little higher than needed for automatic closing of the coupler. Uh, the, still a bit hazardous, the air hoses that operate the brakes, which we'll get to in a few minutes, uh, have to be connected by hand on conventional equipment. Uh, they pull apart on their own. Once the couplers are released, uh, opened, uh, if the cars are pulled or moved apart, the air hoses will separate automatically. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this shows the inner workings of a coupler that has some draft gear. Um, 
some of them use uh, coil springs, some of them use uh, liquid or, or gas or both in, in cylinders, uh, kind of like brake cylinders. Um, and some apparently use both. I'm, I'm not familiar with all the details of, the, of these, not being a, a mechanical engineer. Um, some of you may recall the hydro cushion uh, boxcars that Southern Pacific used uh, for, for fragile freight. So if you had uh, a load of chandeliers or uh, computers or whatever, they'd get a little bit softer treatment in, in coupling the cars. The hydra, H-Y-D-R-A, implying that there was like a hydraulic fluid in these uh, draft gear. Uh, next slide. Of course, couplers come in, in different varieties. Uh, the shelf couplers at the upper left have these extensions above and below, an uh, integral part of the coupler, that do a much better job of keeping the cars uh, aligned and upright in a derailment. Uh, they're required for tank cars carrying flammable and, and hazardous materials. The so-called tight lock couplers on the upper right uh, have much less play, much less chance for movement uh, between them, and so they're typically used in passenger cars uh, where you want to minimize the, the jiggling of people as, as the, the slack runs in and out or the, uh, the little differences in each coupling uh, you know, add up as you as the train is accelerated or decelerated. The lower left uh, shows rotary couplers, which aren't obvious looking at them from the outside, but uh, it's common uh, for coal hauling uh, railroads that use unit trains, uh, trains made up all of one type of car carrying one commodity from one origin to one destination, and say a mine to a, a power plant or to a, a marine terminal, to have the couplers on one end of each car be able to rotate and it, it works just like a regular coupler uh, when it's in service moving along the tracks uh, but when they get to the area where the cars are to be unloaded the car can be uh, the whole train rolls through in one car at a time stops in this rotary device that you see at the right allows the car to be literally tipped over and dumped out dumped upside down almost next slide So in Europe, they never really got over the Lincoln pin idea for their conventional rolling stock. Uh, you can see that looks like a really skimpy, lightweight device in the middle. That's what pulls the train. Uh, freight trains in Europe tend to be shorter and lighter and operate faster uh, than the freight trains in North America. Uh, and so they're able to continue using a, a very, uh, what looks to me, minimal structurally uh, component to, to provide the pulling force. For the buff or pushing force, they use those devices on, on both sides of the, the car that have kind of a piston effect uh, to accommodate the distance between the different corners of the car changing as they go around curves. And you can tell that's kind of a, a cumbersome system. Uh, typically, somebody has to by hand uh, place the link over one of those hooks and then use a that's like a built-in wrench mechanism to, to draw them together to the desired uh, spacing and so for uh, the high speed systems in the rest of the world and for a lot of um, light rail transit systems um, what we used to call street to cars or interurbans uh, now referred to as light rail or trams use couplers that perform the mechanical uh, pu uh, pulling draft and buff forces at once. They provide the air brake connections and uh, even electrical uh, connections for uh, communication and uh, uh, various housekeeping functions within the train. And I, you can probably find a video online, I didn't include one today, that shows two of these vehicles with this kind of coupling uh, coming together and they just go click 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 and everything is uh, together and locked. Uh, next slide. So uh, here's Europe trying to convert uh, or at least doing some research and development on converting their conventional rolling stock to a more automatic kind of coupling. 
complete with airlines and uh, other features. Why they called this digital, I'm not really sure. Uh, if they intend there be to, to, for there to be some kind of data link between cars or not, maybe they just called it digital because digital is fashionable these days and it seems contemporary, and so they, they gave it that label. But as you can see, this is a fairly uh, complicated and I would guess uh, maybe a high maintenance device if it has to be out in the weather and in the, the harsh operating environment of railroads. And that's probably the last slide for couplers. So a quick break for me to take a drink and, oh, no, one more. Uh, so couplers can be ugly, especially those ones that perform all sorts of connections automatically. So the, the high speed rolling stock in uh, China and Europe has these cowlings that can be retracted or extended back out to uh, cover the coupling. They didn't come up with the idea. It was an American invention, I think. We can see a Pennsylvania Railroad steam locomotive lower left and a uh, Burlington uh, uh, General Motors EMD built locomotive on the right where they had uh, cowlings around their front couplers, just mainly to look better. So next slide. Okay, before we get to breaks, any comments or questions? Uh, let's, we'll give it here a second. I don't see anything coming into the chat area yet. Okay, uh, we'll go back to you, Glenn, and if I, oh, wait a minute, here we go. Um, any desire to change couplers in the U.S., Gary asks. I assume that's to, to the more fancy full connection automatic types. Not that I'm aware of. Um, again, the, the light rail systems typically have different kinds of couplers. Um, but for the freight and conventional passenger systems, I'm not aware of any uh, any desire to do that. But there is a, a wrinkle in brakes that we'll get to uh, that that uh, is, is related to the, the the need for various connections between cars, but it's not really involving the couplers. Okay, I, I think that's probably it, Glenn. I'll holler if something else comes through. Okay. Well, this is where I admit I'm really not a mechanical engineer. And if we have any uh, railroad people uh, what, uh, participating today, either current or retired, uh, feel free to, to jump in and, and elaborate here or correct me if I say something wrong, because brakes get complicated. So we have the track gauge set. We have the the vehicles designed and, and ways to connect and disconnect them. Now we need to make sure that once we start the train, we can stop it. If we come to a red signal or an obstruction in the tracks, or even if we're just going downhill and we don't want to go too fast. So uh, typically in a train, each component, each car uh, must have its own effective brakes. This is a long cha a challenge for long freight trains. Uh, where different cars can have different weights and therefore different uh, kinetic energies, different momentum to resist. Uh, before automatic air brakes were invented, each car in a train had an independent brake that was operated and released by hand. Uh, in freight cars, these were on staffs that stuck up above the uh, the tops of the freight cars so that a, a brakeman could uh, operate the brakes on more than one car, usually not more than four or five or six, I think was probably the limit. Uh, there were these running boards on the tops of the, the cars. Uh, now they're illegal, can't have them up there anymore. Um, but you can imagine uh, coming down the Sierras in a snowstorm, an uh, ice storm, uh, trying to make sure that the brakes were properly applied and that the brakeman didn't fall off the top. 
as the cars rocked and swayed and, and went around curves. The communication to uh, apply or re release the brakes, and, uh, well, it depended to some extent on the brakeman's judgment, but it mainly was the engineer using the whistle on the locomotive to say apply brakes or release brakes. Uh, and the, the judgment of the brakeman to, to know how much, the, the tighter the, the wheel is turned, the tighter the, the brake shoes apply to the, the rolling uh, treads of the, of the car's wheels. Uh, passenger cars, tank cars, flat cars had their brake wheels in different positions, uh, most accessible usually from the uh, open vestibule or the, the closed uh, vestibule of a, of a passenger car. Uh, before the co brakes using compressed air came along, there were various experiments using vacuum brakes because people kind of knew how to, to create and use vacuum, reduce pressure. Problem is, uh, even at sea level, the, the most pressure you can get against a vacuum is about 15 pounds per square inch. And the conventional um, air brakes today use about 90 pounds per square inch for freight and about 110 pounds square per square inch for passenger. So uh, it depended on next slide. You know, Mr. George Westinghouse uh, inventing the automatic air brake. Uh, automatic in the sense that if the train parts, if it, if, if it comes uncoupled for some reason, either from the locomotive or between cars back in the train, uh, if it becomes separated sufficiently to pull those air hose connections apart, there's a drop in air pressure in the train line and the reservoir, uh, like a supply tank that's been pressurized under each car, uh, can release its air. Uh, into the brake system and uh, apply the brakes uh, automatically and, and stop the train, hopefully. Um, of course, each uh, locomotive and car still has, a, in effect, a parking brake, uh, either operated by a wheel or a lever that can apply the, the brake shoes to the wheels uh, to keep a car from rolling away, either due to wind or mischief or uh, being on a downgrade. So how do air brakes work? Well, there's a compressor uh, these days powered by an, uh, an electric motor on the locomotives that uh, uh, feeds compressed air into uh, pipes under the, uh, the cars and these rubber hoses that provide fle flexible connection between them. Each car has a reservoir that pulls the compressed air and a very clever thing called a triple valve that uh, involves springs. We'll see in a following slide uh, kind of how this works. But one, once the train line is charged, uh, it has to have that certain level of air pressure in it to keep the brakes from applying in order for that automatic aspect of the system to work. What's difficult is in a conventional air brake system, the change in air pressure takes the place of the engineer blowing his whistle in the early days for the when the brakeman rode the tops of the cars. The engineer reducing the pressure in the train line <clears throat> is what applies the brakes. So you can imagine that if uh, you reduce the pressure, that means venting it to the atmosphere, you're sacrificing your ability to, to then again apply the brakes. Um, and I'll skip the automatic train control, positive train control exception I noted at the bottom here uh, today. Um, that simply is, uh, th those are systems that in certain situations can automatically apply the brakes uh, without the engineer uh, acting. Uh, so next slide. Uh, thanks to Trains Magazine, we have this uh, about the clearest illustration I've seen of how the uh, air brake system works. Uh, this is being recorded, so you can come back and, and study this at your leisure if you want to get a better understanding of how the the uh, system works with charging the train line, building up the pressure, filling the reservoir un under each car, uh, and then uh, releasing the the brakes. Uh, if you've ever ridden the uh, 
Surfliner out of San Luis Obispo, or the, I think of the same thing with the Starlight. After they've come down Cuesta Grade and stopped at the station, when they pull out again, uh, they do a, a running air test, and the engineer will uh, release a little bit of air from the, the train brake system uh, that you'll feel this a very slight slowing. He, he doesn't uh, slack off on the throttle usually, and the uh, uh, the conductor uh, who can monitor the, the, the brake activity by the, the pressure uh, back in the train will say a good set and a good release uh, as the engineer uh, releases the brakes and they will continue on. But they do that to make sure that the, the air brake system is working before they, they get up to uh, speed uh, on their continuation of their trip. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I, I like to scare my students by, by showing this and saying there will be a quiz on this system, and then, of course, there isn't. Um, but this is from the Westinghouse um, manual on, on using and maintaining air brakes, and you can see it, it gets pretty complicated with the uh, flow of air at various pressure in, in various directions uh, from the locomotive back through the train. Uh, the locomotives actually have two types of air brake, the so-called independent brake, which applies just on the locomotive, and then the automatic brake, which also applies back through the train. And operating these systems is, is truly an art. It takes experience to learn how to do it well so that you don't have uh, slack running in uh, or out and shaking up people in the locomotive or in the caboose in the days of cabooses. Uh, next slide. Uh, I won't read this to you, uh, just summarize. Uh, another tricky aspect is on conventional uh, freight train braking systems, you can't partially release the brakes as you're coming down a, a grade or approaching a station. Uh, you have to do a full release uh, and then uh, let the air brake pressure uh, build back up and then uh, apply the brakes again, with the exception of retainers, which were a special kind of valve that were mounted under each freight car. I, I think they still are required for cars in interchange. And the conductor or a brakeman before descending a steep grade would set the retainers to partially keep the brakes applied, uh, hopefully no matter what. Uh, and they'd have to so-called knock down the retainers when they got to bot the bottom of the grade so that the uh, brake uh, shoes wouldn't still be applied as they continued on their trip. But, Coming down uh, grades, they had to uh, stop periodically on a long grade uh, to let the wheels cool off because they would literally get so hot from the friction of the brake shoes that they would glow red and pieces of brake shoe would get overheated and come off and go flying off into the weeds. And, uh, so uh, very difficult operation in, in the steam locomotive days. Uh, important to keep the air in the train line dry because if it's humid uh, and the pressure changes as the pressure drops, the temperature drops, and uh, in cold weather that can lead to ice buildup in the system, and that can lead to bad things. Uh, next slide. Uh, so where do the, the brake shoes apply on freight cars to the, the tread of the wheel, on passenger cars typically to discs, they use calipers that grip the discs uh, pretty much like on, on automobiles. Uh, next slide. So the big improvement with so-called diesel locomotives, which are re really diesel electric, is that the actual tractive uh, work is done by electric motors. And the cool thing about electric motors, as I'm sure Gary C. could enlighten us in detail, is that they also serve as generators. Uh, if you wire them the right way and let them turn and uh, have a load across the uh, the, the outgoing uh, flow of electricity. It actually imposes a resistance to, to motion within the within the generator, and that resistance to motion can serve as a brake uh, for a train uh, slowing either for a station or for coming down a, a grade. Uh, greatly reduces the, the wear on the brake shoe systems. Uh, Combined use of dynamic uh, electrical resistance braking and air brakes uh, results in much smoother operation. 
The other really cool thing about dynamic braking is that if you have a transit system where trains are uh, constantly coming in and out of stations, speeding up, slowing down, you can use that generated electricity uh, generated by the braking, you can feed it back into the system. And so a train that's slowing down can help a train that's accelerating. Uh, in fact, the uh, Great Northern Railway and the Milwaukee Road uh, Railway in the Pacific Northwest that had uh, systems powered light, largely by hydropower uh, also had some potential for this regenerative braking where a, a train going down the slope of the Rockies or the Cascades could uh, help a train coming up the grade uh, provide power to that train uh, through the, uh, the overhead wire system. Um, next slide. And there's some more exotic forms of using electricity for braking. Uh, you can uh, have devices that, uh, through electromagnetism, uh, pull down against the, uh, the rails and apply braking force that way. Uh, and there's one that actually uses no physical contact at all. It just relies on the uh, fact that as, you know, as, a, as an electric current flows, it creates a magnetic field, and as a magnetic field, changes, it, it induces an electric current, and that can transfer some of that resistance to the, the rails without any physical contact. And where does all that energy go? Well, it, it actually warms up the rails a little bit, uh, but not enough to, to make any difference to the, the alignment of the track. And next slide. We have reached the end of our trip. Um, I appreciate your, your patience and your attention. Uh, we have a few minutes left before 11 o'clock. So again, if there are questions or, or comments, now is the time. I have a question uh, about track gauge. Uh, I seem to recall reading that the after the Civil War, the track gauge in the South was changed from the five-foot gauge to the standard gauge, and that they did the whole conversion in one day. Is, is, am I remembering that right? I, I, I forgot to mention that part. I, I'm not sure about the one day, but it definitely was a, a blitz type of operation where they had all their regular employees out ready to go, everybody they could recruit from the, the farms and the towns and everywhere. And they pulled up the spikes, uh, shifted one rail over a few inches and spiked it back down. And so they, they tried to do it probably in a weekend, uh, but I doubt they were able to do all the switches and, and uh, you know, crossings, the areas where you have points and frogs and, and more complicated track work uh, would have required uh, longer. But yes, they, they made the decision. The, the other thing I didn't mention uh, as a reason for different gauges, and it was true uh, in the northeastern United States uh, in the, the early 1800s, uh, different states and different cities wanted different gauges. The local merchants not wanting competition from those you know rascals a, a few miles over uh, shipping their stuff in by, by rail. Now that rail was available, it, it made shipping so much uh, cheaper that, you know, a little cost advantage from local production was lost. And so they they had different track gauges even, uh, you know, among the, the northeastern states. Uh, but it didn't take them long to realize that that wasn't such a good idea, and they, they standardized it. How did they tend to regauge the rolling stock? Did they change the wheel sets, or did they have something more creative to still use the old wheel sets but somehow modify them? It, it seems like the whole truck, the whole wheel assembly, would need to be changed because That's the, what I would think. the bolster, which goes from side to side, is a, a set length. It's, the trucks are typically three pieces, and all that holds them together is gravity. There's the bolster that goes side to side, and the side frames, and then the, 
the, the journal boxes that fit into those and the axle ends that fit into the journal boxes. And it seems like, yeah, you need a whole bunch of, of uh, trucks ready to go to, to uh, you know, lift up the cars and set them down on those. Yeah. I don't know on that international gauge change between Russia and China how they handled the brake system because the brake rigging also connects the car frame to the the truck. There isn't much to it. I mean, it's usually just a, a steel rod or a chain, but that, that would have to be disconnected and reconnected as well. Any other questions? I see something in chat. Uh, that was uh, the question about the Civil War change. Oh, okay. Well, uh, as you're all pondering that last minute question, let me throw this uh, closing slide up to remind you of our uh, next parlor car chat. Oh, and before I forget, thank you, thank you, thank you to Glenn Madison for doing this uh, presentation today. We love having other people share their passions uh, with the group. So if any of you are interested or know someone who might be interested in uh, uh, sharing their passion via uh, uh, a parlor car chat, uh, just let me know. there. And here's a, an address you can send an email to, chats at slorn.com. Uh, the address above here is the Parlor Car Chats page on the website. You can find out about coming up and previously recorded ones. There's the donate page. And on April 10th, uh, that's the next Parlor Car Chat that's scheduled, we'll have a presentation on the California Shortline Railroad Association by presented by the uh, executive director of that organization, Don Norton. So um, please join us for that. Uh, also, any uh, last comment or yes, question? Uh, Jack, Jack Hutchinson posted a link to a YouTube video about the gauge changing for the Civil War. The YouTube video is called "The Day the Gauge Changed." So if you if you look for that on YouTube, the day the gauge changed, evidently there's a, an interesting YouTube about how they did that. Excellent. Thank you. Anything else? Going once? Going twice? All right. Going three times. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks. That was great. That was great.